I, uh, I have a, I have this, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, this, this urgency, if you will, um, that I've been sensing for a few weeks now, and I've been praying and asking the Lord, like, what does this mean? Like, what, what exactly are you, are you, are you getting at? Because a lot of times when, I don't know if you have ever experienced the nudge of God in your life, where you sense like God is trying to get your focus to be on something or he's trying to get your attention to be on something, but it isn't really that like obvious yet. You just kind of know like there's something that's happening and God's trying to make himself, you know, known to you so that you can pay attention to the thing that he's trying to get you to pay attention to. And for me, sometimes it's easy and and sometimes it, it takes a minute for me to zero in and, and tune my ear into the, to what the Lord is speaking. But the one thing that God's been saying over and over to me that I feel like he, he's gonna show us in scripture in the next few weeks is this concept that God has from the very beginning initiated a process that started in the beginning in the book of Genesis. It started with the account of creation and, and it and it. It began to move forward into the lives of people and into the relationships that God had with people. And it continues to this very day. And this idea, this concept is that God is constantly in a mode of expansion, of expanding things, of growing things. And this plays out in our lives as human beings, especially when we come to a place where we begin to experience the power of God working in our life. Um, it happens in practical ways, it happens in spiritual ways, it happens in visible ways, and it happens in invisible ways. But the, the, the point is that when a person comes in contact with the creator of the universe, there's an expansion that begins to take place that is uncontainable. It just begins to take over and it begins to affect us in ways that, that are awesome, that are, that are, that are beautiful. But this process of expansion has with it certain things that must be dealt with. And the things that must be dealt with originate in our thinking. They originate in the places that we come from and and in the belief systems that we've adopted. And so I believe that God wants for us to address some of these things head on because God wants for us to be able to enter into a place where the expansion process of God is fully realized and uninterrupted and unhindered. And so, in order for us to go there, I wanna, I wanna drop a thought in your mind that I hope you'll grab a hold of and just like Vinny just led us in a song that says, I believe everything you say to me and I receive everything you have for me. These are more than just lyrics on a, on a song. These become prayers of a heart or they become declarations that we would say to God and say, God, this is how I, this is how I believe and this is how I'm gonna posture myself to receive the things that you have for me. I wanna say something to you tonight that we're gonna, we're gonna look at again and again and again. And the statement that I wanna make to you is just simply this, that, that our Father, that that the God of the universe, the creator of all things, is the God of much more. The God of more, the God of wanting to take us into places where the things that we see now begin to grow into so much more than what our little perspective is able to process right now. I was just out in front of the church just before we came in and I was talking to a couple of my brothers and I was just listening to the conversation and both of them were sharing stories about the current season in their life of experience, of experiencing what I'm talking about right now with the expansion of the kingdom of God and the blessing of God in their life. And both of these brothers I've known for many, many years and so I know the backstory leading up to the current story. And it's not been easy and it hasn't been, uh, you know, the most uh, 
obvious road to follow. It's been, it's been difficult and it's been challenging. But the thing is about this walk with God that I will tell you and that they are experiencing, and I know there's many more here that are experiencing the same thing, including myself, is that when you come to a place to where you fix your eyes on Jesus, like we talked about last week, and you don't, hold, you don't let go, but you hold on to the truth that God has given to you to hold on to, and that begins to become the overriding process in your life of I'm just not gonna let go. No matter what happens, no matter what, what things go right or wrong or whatever, I am just not gonna let go of the thing that God has given to me, and I am gonna hold on to the truth that's been given to my life. You begin to go through these processes that lead to the expansion of what I believe that God wants for us to experience in our lives. So tonight, if you're feeling like giving up, then don't quit because there is more for you. If you're here tonight and you feel like this is not worth it, the hard times are not worth it, this walk is not worth it, the the, the, the life is just not worth it, then I would tell you just hang on because there is so much more to come and it is worth it. Don't stop. If you're feeling like things will never change, if you feel like I've been doing this long enough and it just won't change, they will change. Things will change. There is more to come. I wanna share with you a couple stories tonight as we start talking about some of these things that we need to address head on. And these are, uh, these are stories that Jesus tells um, that have to do with some very, very things, near and dear things to our hearts, and I believe that God wants to speak to us tonight about it. The first one is found in Matthew chapter 18, and uh, Jesus has just gotten done uh, talking about some very uh, familiar things to us. He's, he's, he's been talking about the parable of the lost sheep, about leaving the 99 and going after the one. And then he, he starts talking about the, the very common thing of, of breakdown of relationships where we get into fights or disagreements with one another and Jesus begins to instruct us. He says, hey, if you're in a disagreement with a Christian brother, you're supposed to go after your brother. You're supposed to forget about all of the religious to-dos and you're supposed to go after your brother and you're supposed to pursue them. Jesus is talking about relationships and he's talking about pursuing the ones who we would not necessarily want to pursue after. And then he gets to this point and Peter comes walking up to Jesus and he asks him, he says, Peter says, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who has sinned against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. And then Jesus starts to talk about the kingdom. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with the servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of the king's debtors was brought in who owed him a million dollars. Couldn't pay. And so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. And then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went out to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars and he grabbed him by the throat and he demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged him for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. And then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? And then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. And that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. The story right here that Jesus talks about is one that is full of example after example of things that I think most of us can probably relate to. Um, 
This is a story of relationships that Jesus is trying to get us to see the value of. He's trying to get us to see the value of how important God looks at relationships and how God is wanting for us to see the relational connection to the kingdom of heaven. How there, there can't be this mindset that it's just me and God in the kingdom and I'm all by myself and my life doesn't interact with other people. Every teaching about the kingdom of God and everything that is woven through scripture portrays this concept of connectedness, this concept of unity, that God's heart is for his body to be unified. And so one of the, this, one of the chief strategies of the darkness is to try to disrupt the unity of God's kingdom at all costs, to try to bring division, to try to separate and divide, to try to make us believe that our theology makes it impossible for us to actually have spiritual unity because, well, we believe different about certain things. Lie, big fat lie. The enemy wants for us to believe that because we come from different places, we can't relate to one another. We worship with different styles. We have different mannerisms. Lie, 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 lie. All of these things are, are constantly brought back to pursue relationship at all costs. Be peacemakers, forgive, go after the one, do the things that, that, that is at the heart of God. And so in this story, Jesus uses an analogy of a king who has loaned money. And he finally comes to the time and he says, I got to settle my debts. I've got I've to see how much money I've got out there. It's, it's time for me to collect on all of the bills that, that I've got coming. Like, I, you know, enough Mr. Nice Guy. I'm not, I'm, I, you know, my... my tapped out. I need my money back. So he starts calling everybody in. He's like, it's time for you to pay up. You told me you'd pay this or whatever. And this guy comes in and it says he comes before the king and he owes him millions of dollars. And so the master says, you're going to have to pay. You got to pay something. So he's like, in those days, you know, they, people were sold into slavery, which mind blown. I can't even relate to that. But He's like, okay, well, if you can't pay the money, then you're going to have to pay with, with your family. You're going to have to, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take your, everything that you've got. And the man says something to him. And it's really interesting what the man says to the king. It says that he fell down and begged him and he said, please be patient with me. Please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Please be patient with me. It's really interesting to me that Jesus uses this, this phrasing in this story. See, the king hears this, this cry and he, he shows this man incredible, incredible mercy and kindness. And he says, you know what? I'm not gonna be patient with you. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna meet you halfway. I'm not gonna be patient and give you more time. He does something crazy in the story. He says, you're asking me to be patient with you, but instead, I'm gonna give you something that you don't get to participate in in any way. I'm not gonna give you more time so you can try harder. I'm not gonna be patient with you. Instead, I'm gonna completely wipe out your debt, 100%. You get no credit and you get no participation for this. I'm not going to let you participate in this matter anymore. You have failed and I will come through and show you an arm of mercy that you don't deserve. Mind-blowing. And so then Jesus continues the parable and he says, and so the guy goes out and he sees somebody else that owes him money. And we've read this story a hundred times. This is our story. We know it by heart. And the guy, he looks at the guy that owes him a few bucks and he grabs him by the throat. And what does the guy say to him? The same exact thing. Please be patient with me. I'll pay it all back. In this parable, Jesus shows the hand of mercy and what it looks like to be extended. And he looks at this opportunity to be the giver of the hand of mercy and to be able to be the one to say, this is how it looked when I received it and so this is how it looks when I give it. And instead the man withheld it and he threw him in jail 
for a much lesser crime, for a much lesser offense. And Jesus uses this parable to teach us something that is so deeply ingrained in us. And this thing that is so deeply ingrained in us comes squarely against this concept that God is the God of expansion and God is the God of more. And it comes squarely against this mindset that it should be so easy for us to understand and yet it's so hard for us to get it. And the concept is freely you've been given something you didn't deserve so freely you should give it away. But somehow in the process we receive it and we love it but then we hoard it and keep it. Why? Because there's a fundamental belief that we're hanging on to that is wrong. That fundamental belief is not that God is the God of expansion and more, but that somehow God's given me something now I've got to protect it and keep it because I need to make sure that I've got myself taken care of. My friend, everything about the kingdom economy is all about keep it moving. In and through your life, everything you receive, you're, you're, you're supposed to pass it on. You don't hold on to anything. You receive it, you get blessed, and then you bless others. Everything comes through your life, and it begins to be what the Bible portrays as this picture of the living water of God just flowing through your life. You know what? It, it, it's like this this constant cleansing. The Bible uses the scripture as an analogy of itself and says, when you read the scripture, it's like a cleansing process in your mind or your soul where it just the washing of the water of God's word just continually keeps things flowing through your life. I am no, I'm not the only one in this room that has a tendency to wanna to hold on to things. I know that I'm not the only one Forgiveness, forgiveness is at ground zero. It is the foundation of everything that the kingdom of God is built upon. Forgiveness has to be the one thing that we begin to understand that it comes through my life and I just keep it going, that I am going to get hurt and I am going to get abused and I am going to get burned, but forgiveness comes and forgiveness is gonna go. I will not hoard the forgiveness that I have been given. It will flow through my life because in this story we see that this is at the core of learning to experience the expansion, and the more of our God. Forgiveness. I want to share another story that talks about the same thing as we drive this point home tonight. Another story found in the book of Luke chapter 7. Starting in verse 36, it says, One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. And when a certain immoral woman from that city heard that Jesus was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar that was filled with expensive perfume. And then she knelt down behind Jesus at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on Jesus' feet and she wiped them with her hair. She kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man was really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. And then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. And then Jesus told him this story. He said, a man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither one of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Simon, who do you suppose loved him more after that? I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. And then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears 
and she's wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and, and they are many, they have been forgiven. So she has been shown, she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. And then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And the men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Another story that Jesus uses that talks about a big debt. He talks about money and he talks about a big debt and he uses this idea that so many of us can relate to of being under a heavy load, a big debt. And he he uses these stories, Jesus uses these stories to bring us to a place to try to shake us loose from things that for some reason are so hard for us to wrap our head around and to let go of sometimes. I don't know if you've ever had that, if you've ever had that uh, epiphany of what it would feel like to have a debt that was so big that you knew you, you were never going to be able to pay it. I've got, my, my oldest son is, he's going to be 23 pretty soon here, and, and my middle son Micah, you know, we've, he's in college right now, and you know, their whole age group, all these kids that are, they're going to college, and and I'm hearing stories as they're, as they're graduating from college, and some of them have racked up, you know, just enormous bills of college debt, you know, student loans and, and all this stuff. And um, this one kid I was talking to the other day, and he, you could just see in his face, you know, as he's working at Starbucks, you know, he's got his college degree, and it's, he didn't find what he was looking for right now. And he's just like, the, the look and the, the, the fear of like, I am never going to pay this thing off. And I'm like, you're probably right. <laughs> you probably won't. I'm sorry, bro. But it's, uh, it's that feeling of, it's that feeling of hopelessness, really. It's that feeling of, I don't know what to do. I'm, I feel like I've got this, this little chisel and this little hammer, and I'm just like, Chink, 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 chink. And the rock is so big, you know, it's like this enormous thing. And I, I don't know how I'm ever going to even make a, a, a dent in it. And if you're here tonight and you've got student loans, then can we all just pray right now for anybody with this? this? <laughs> it's, it's the American way these days, I guess, you know, it's God bless you. Jesus knew what kind of stories to tell to get us to relate to what he was trying to teach. And here again, he uses two people. He's like, okay, so you got two people in this story. One was given, you know, we'll use dollars, $50, and the other was given $500. They were using coins, pieces of silver. But the point is they were both indebted. They were both given something that they neither one could repay. If you've ever been in a place in life where you've owed something or owed somebody and you didn't have a job and you didn't have any means to pay it back, it doesn't matter how big the debt is. It doesn't matter if it's two bucks or if it's two million bucks. You cannot pay it back. You just can't. And so the feeling that you feel begins to wear on you. It begins to weigh you down. It begins to make you feel exhausted. It begins to make you feel like, I don't know what to do. I can't understand how I'm gonna get out of this situation. And Jesus uses this analogy to talk about gratitude and love. Now, the setup of this story of this woman that comes into this house and begins to minister to Jesus is again, a story that we can relate to. She comes into this home and the people that see the encounter cannot comprehend what is going on. They cannot see past the surface or the obvious of what's going on. And in this moment, Jesus begins to teach the truth about the heart of the Father. Begins to teach 
to break down the mindsets that keep us from being able to receive the things that God has for us that are present in this room right now. Some of us have adopted mindsets that prevent us from receiving what God is right now laying before you and saying, this is what I have for your life. And you can't take it because of the mindsets that you've received and that you've adopted along the way of your life. And God says, let me try to chip away at these things. In this story, this woman who has lived a life of sin and everybody knows it, comes in because she heard that Jesus was gonna be in this home. And she comes in and she begins to put into action the response to the life that she's been given. She understands that she's been forgiven of her sins and she comes and she demonstrates that gratitude. And the people in the room cannot understand it. See, the thing is in this story that's so important to understand is that the people in the room that were looking at this sinful woman anoint Jesus, they were just as sinful as she was. But their sin looked different, so they couldn't recognize it. This is the big tragedy that happens in our culture when we begin to adopt a religious mindset that begins to convince us that my ways can somehow become religious enough or clean enough or good enough that God will finally accept me for the things that I have done. My friend, these people were watching this woman in this interaction with Christ and all they could feel was judgment. This man is an imposter because he's allowing a sinner to get close to him. If this man was a real prophet, he would never allow this to happen. All the while, they could not understand the heart and the sin that they were infested with that was causing them to miss the grace and the mercy that was put on a lavish display right in front of them that was a replica of the heart of the Messiah, the heart of their father, the heart of their creator that they were supposedly following after. The huge disconnect that kept them from being able to receive everything that God had for them in that moment. Jesus uses this analogy of money and then he talks about it as a comparison to currency. He says, the one who was forgiven little is gonna love little, but the one who's been forgiven much is going to love much. They didn't understand that Jesus was talking about them. They didn't understand that Jesus was like, let me just give you a play on words about this whole setup right here. You guys think that your sin is just microscopic and it reflects in your love. It's microscopic. You don't realize the depth of what God has done for you. In, what this, in this story, in the setup that, that, that Jesus is using and that we're looking at tonight and how we play into this story is that God is taking us on a journey where he's beginning to show us that the things that we believe about God are way, way, way too small. The things that we think that God can and will do in our life are way, way too small. God wants to show us the expansion power that is alive inside of you the moment that you put your trust in Christ and he fills you with his spirit. The power of the expansion process that is going to begin going through your life, the expansion process that Jesus came and started and then left and then said, watch what's about to happen. Acts chapter two, when the Holy Spirit invades humanity in a very present way and the church begins to explode in numbers daily. People begin to walk in this new revelation of who God is. People up until that point in Acts chapter two, when they didn't know what to do, you know what they would do? They would draw straws and they would draw straws and say, well, let's, let's let God speak to us through this. You know what stopped happening after Acts chapter two? They threw the straws away. You know why? Because God started talking talking to people directly, he started speaking to their hearts because he was alive within them. The spirit of God working in and through people's lives. So this process of Jesus using these stories, and there's more, but these are the two we'll look at tonight, of Jesus using forgiveness and concepts of debt together, it carries forward into the teachings of Paul. And Paul begins to talk about 
being in debt. He starts talking about practical matters. He starts talking about the government and how God has established authority in our lives and God has established governments and all these different practical matters. But then all of a sudden in the middle of the book of, of the, the letter of Romans, Paul starts to say this. He says, he, he veers away from the practical and he starts to go into the spiritual. And he says in Romans 13, eight, he says, don't owe anything to anyone except, check this out, your outstanding debt to continually love one another. For the one who learns to love has fulfilled every requirement of the law. For the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And every other commandment can be summed up in these words. Love and value others the same way you love and value yourself. Love makes it impossible to harm another. So love fulfills all that the law requires. He says, don't owe anything to anyone except your outstanding debt to continually love one another. One of the things that, that has taken me quite a few years to come to terms with is the concepts of the fact that Christ came and set me free. He came and set me free from the power that ruled my life, the power of sin and death. He came and broke the effects of the curse that had been put on my life. He came and he set me free the, the work of the cross and the atonement, it's finished and it's complete and it's, it's everything. And it's been so hard for me to learn how to operate and to live in freedom, to, to, to begin to understand what does it li look like to live as a free man in Christ and to learn to enjoy the freedoms that Christ paid his, his ultimate life to, to, to give to me and to be able to let me begin to experience. One of the things that I've learned is that as a free man, there are certain things within my life that I will never ever be free from. That even though I'm free, there are certain things in my life that still govern me. I am not my own authority I'm surrendered to the ways of God and to his, way, his commands and to his word. I am not free to just do whatever I want, whatever makes sense to me. No, I have the mind of Christ operating within me and it governs my life and it brings into play the heart and the thoughts of the spirit of God in every situation that I surrender to. And so I begin to learn that even though I'm free, I am completely indebted to God. When Jesus talks about these concepts of a person having a huge debt on their life that they could not ever pay back, and then just as the king says, I don't want to meet you halfway. I don't want, you to give, I don't want to give you more time to pay your debt. I want instead to use my arm of mercy and I want to wipe the debt out completely. When I have had my debt completely wiped out by the cross of Christ, when I have had that debt completely removed from my life, I begin to realize what Paul is talking about here when I begin to understand that even though my debt has been paid and I no longer have that debt in my life, there's a new debt that I have. And the new debt that I feel it's a different feeling than being under a heavy load. Oh, my friends, this is the feeling of joy, of knowing that I am now connected to something that is going to be with me for the rest of my life, but this isn't the kind of debt that burdens me down. This is the kind of debt that actually empowers me to be freer and to run. And it's this debt of understanding that I am now joined with the very love that came after me and and broke off the debt of sin and shame. And now I get to be a carrier of that same love to share it with every person that I come in contact with. And so it's this understanding that the scripture receives, which is the debt that we, the debt that we were born with, this debt that we inherited, it was paid. I'm free. We were set free from a bad debt that could never be paid. But then I was given this new debt of love 
And this new debt can never be paid either. It's like the, the debt of, of darkness was removed and the debt of light was given. And this new debt is something that is, I can't even, I can't even put words accurately to it, but it comes down to this one thing that you have to ask yourself. And it's this, this truth that the debt that was paid that I owed, the debt that I owed, the debt that we owed, it was paid by Christ. It was paid by another person. The debt that we owed was paid by another. And now how will we respond to that revelation? How will we respond to that understanding that my debt has been paid by another? When we ask ourselves, how do I respond? We go right back into the stories of Jesus. We go right back into the two contrasting people in his stories. The first story shows the man who was given the incredible mercy. And the mercy that this guy received didn't translate to the guy on the street. The mercy the guy received, the millions of dollars that was wiped clean, it wasn't partially wiped clean. It wasn't, okay, hey, I'm going to give you a more time to pay this back. It was removed. And he goes out into the street and he has the chance to be able to celebrate with the guy that owes him a few bucks and he doesn't make the exchange. He says, I'm going to receive it, but I'm, I can't give it. Nope. I can't do it. I can't give it. And Jesus tells another story. He says, okay, but this woman comes into this house and she's, she's weeping. She can't stop crying. Why is she on her knees bawling her eyes out at the feet of Jesus? What is going on here? Everybody in the room is there just like, we don't understand what's going on. And Jesus is like, I can't really explain it to you like conversationally. I don't, can't tell you what is going on inside of her heart. But let me tell you a story about you and her, Okay. There's, there's two people that both owe money. Neither one of them can pay it back. They both got their debt wiped clean. And one of them is a lot more grateful than the other. Which one are you in this story? See, my friends, the whole point of this is about the question of how do we respond to the understanding that the debt we owed was paid by another? How do we respond? Who are we? Are we in the first story or are we in the second story? What is going to happen when we begin to wrap all of this into the understanding of our God is the God of much more? Our God is the God of expansion. Our God is the God that says, I'm not satisfied just to have you sitting in a church service somewhere experiencing my grace. I'm not satisfied with that. I want your children here. I want your parents here. I want your, your, your siblings. I want your neighborhood here. I want you to see that your life is now full of something that is going to expand. It's going to grow. It's going to come out of you because this is the nature of, of the kingdom of God. This is the nature of the creative force that God had on display when he said, let there be light. And there was light. And the things began to happen at the word of God. My friends, how do you respond right now to these understandings? This is more than just a forgiveness talk tonight. If you have people that you need to forgive, then absolutely keep that forgiveness flowing through your life. Do not hoard it for a second. Do not think that it belongs to you. Do not think that you get to retain it. It moves through your life. You get to participate and act like your father. Freely you've been forgiven, freely forgive. This is not a money talk exclusively. Though there's money principles in all of this, this is not just a gratitude talk tonight of being thankful for what you've been forgiven of, though we've been forgiven so much. Collectively in this room, if we were to say, okay, a sin equals 10 bucks, I mean, money to the ceiling. I mean, it's like, This is more than any of those things. This is us beginning to align ourselves with what is coming next. 
See, there's something on the horizon that God is doing right here, right now, and it is not exclusive to this area. I don't, I, you guys, Jesus said over and over, those that have eyes to see and those that have ears to hear, let them hear, let them see. Everywhere I go, every person I encounter that is full of the kingdom of God, you know what they're all saying? They're all excited. Everybody's doing this. Everybody's like, oh, I can't wait. It's coming. It's coming. Things are happening in the spirit realm right now that I can't even, you can't see it with these eyes, but you see it with these eyes. And it's because God is getting ready to blow the roof off of this place. He wants to show the world that he is good. He's been lied about for too long. The darkness has overrun this world for too long and God is getting ready to I was just hearing a testimony this last week about what is happening on the continent of Africa right now they're having not this is not like a once in a while occasion they're having over a million people showing up for revival crusades on the regular where people are just pre preaching the gospel and people are just coming out a million people. You guys, these, this is stuff that's happening around the world and God is not going to leave little old America out of what he's doing worldwide. What I, wrap all this up. I'll talk all night if I don't stop myself. <laughs> to wrap all this up, you have two people in these stories tonight that you can align yourself with. The choice is yours. If you align yourself with the first person who received their debt wiped out, you will not be able to experience what I'm talking about. The God of the much more. The expansion that is coming because you will be stuck in a prison cell of your own making just like Jesus used in that story. You refuse to forgive, you refuse to pass it on, you refuse to let God move through your life. You're going to receive and it's going to sit and you're going to be miserable. Or you can align yourself with the other who begins to recognize, Lord, I don't deserve the mercy you've given, but you've given it to me anyway. And I wanna just sit at your feet and I'm gonna cry and I'm gonna thank you. But that's not the end of the story because I am going to get up just like that woman did. She didn't live there. She got up and she began to go out and live what God had done in her life. And when Paul says, don't owe anything to anyone except for this one debt that you'll have for the rest of your life, you're gonna be indebted to love everybody on the regular, continually. This is the operation of the kingdom of God, to begin to take what's been given and to pass it through your life into the person that you encounter and to begin to experience the joy that comes from watching God's love affect the people around you. Do you have anybody in your life right now that's hard to love or am I the only one? then that's the person that you get to start praying for first. Lord, teach me how to love the hard to love.